Hello and good morning, everyone. The health and well being of Ontarians is and always has been our top priority. In response to COVID 19, our government has had to make a number of decisions, often very difficult ones, that have profoundly affected people's lives. We know, though, that this pandemic is going to be with us for some time. That's why last week we unveiled our province's COVID-19 response framework, developed in consultation with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the uh, Public Health Measures Table, and other health experts. The Keeping Ontario Safe and Open framework ensures that public health measures are targeted, incremental, and responsive, and gives us the flexibility to allocate resources where they're most needed. In Peel Region, the seven-day indicators of public health trends support the decision to move the region into red control level. Recently, Peel's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Lowe, put in place additional public health measures for that region. Local authorities and medical officers of health have the ability to tailor restrictions in their communities based on local circumstances. To further support the communities in Peel Region, our government is taking immediate action to stop the spread of COVID-19. We are providing more locations and innovative testing options to help increase access to testing. These include establishing three new community-based testing centres in Brampton by tomorrow, at Snell Grove Community Centre, Gore Meadows Community Centre and Greenbrier Community Centre. Mobile testing sites, including one at the CMHA Peel Dufferin Mobile Health Clinic in Brampton, to respond to an increase in local demand for tests and to provide access in testing in communities where travel is a barrier. We're also opening walk-in availability at assessment centres for those who can't book online or by phone and implementing up to seven pharmacies or specimen collection centres in partnership with Life Labs, Dynacare and Alpha over the next two weeks. In addition, we are working with community leaders throughout the region to promote awareness of the importance of testing. Our government is also providing additional case and contact management support to Peel Regional Health Unit. This includes onboarding up to 70 additional case and contact management staff to directly support Peel Region and collaborating with 10 other public health units with lower case counts to provide additional case investigation assistance. To support hospital capacity pressures and the continuation of surgeries and procedures, Ontario is investing $42 million for up to 234 new beds at three hospitals and their alternate health facilities in Peel Region. This will include William Osler Health System receiving up to 87 total patient beds, Trillium Health Partners receiving up to 141 total patient beds, and Headwaters Healthcare receiving up to six new patient beds. We're also taking action to support businesses in Peel Region which Minister McNaughton and Minister Sarkaria will touch on in just a few moments. Together, these targeted actions will support the ongoing efforts to stop and, and uh, contain the spread of COVID-19. All options are on the table to protect the health and safety of individuals and families living in Peel Region. We will continue to work with our local partners in the coming days and weeks to provide the additional support in Peel Region as required. But once again, I want to remind people that the best way to protect yourselves and your loved ones from COVID-19 is to maintain physical distancing, to wear a mask where required or in places where physical distancing can't be maintained, wash your hands thoroughly and often, and if you're feeling ill, please stay inside, please don't go to work and please don't go out. By following these simple, simple uh, advice and symptom management, we can protect the, uh, our loved ones and uh, contain the spread of COVID-19 in Peel Region and across Ontario. Now I would like to invite Mayor, Minister McNaughton to please come to the podium.
Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Minister uh, Elliott, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, the top priority for my ministry and our government is making sure that everyone comes home safe to their families after a hard day's work. That priority has been highlighted since the very beginning of this pandemic. We know that most businesses are operating in safe and responsible ways to protect their workers and their customers. However, there are still some businesses that need help, and that's why we are doing community safety campaigns. Over the weekend, 56 provincial officers visited 330 supermarkets, big box stores, and other retail outlets in Peel Region. Their primary goal was to help businesses stay safe and stay open. Officers checked that stores were following public health measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. That included things we've all been doing for months, such as maintaining physical distance from others and wearing face coverings in indoor public spaces. They also checked to ensure mandatory COVID-19 workplace safety plans were in place. Safety plans are now required for certain businesses in public health regions identified as being in the protect, restrict, control, or lockdown levels. This includes restaurants and bars, sports and recreational facilities, retail stores and malls, personal care services, and several others. A full list is available in Ontario's COVID-19 response framework at Ontario.ca. In Peel, over 82% of workplaces were following public health requirements. Any contraventions found were resolved with education and compliance assistance, and no tickets were issued. The successful Peel campaign and an earlier one in London Middlesex are just the beginning. The officers who volunteered for these campaigns are part of a province-wide multi-ministry team being coordinated by my ministry and the Ministry of the Solicitor General. The team consists of more than 170 Provincial Offences officers from various ministries. They are coordinating with local public health, police and bylaw services to conduct more COVID-19 education and support campaigns. They'll work mainly in higher risk areas, areas of the province and in regions that are requesting additional help. Over the next few weeks, they're scheduled to be in Waterloo, Toronto, York Region and others. Over a million people now have already viewed the resources available to employers and workers. Working with our health and safety partners, we posted over 200 guidance documents, videos, posters and tip sheets online. This includes a step-by-step -step guide for completing a workplace safety plan. These resources and others are available at www.ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety. If you haven't already, I encourage you to read them. Finally, I would like to thank my colleagues who are supporting this multi-ministry campaign. Rod Phillips, Minister of Finance, Caroline Mulroney, Minister of Transportation, Jeff Urich, Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and Stephen Lecce, Minister of Education, whose teams were out with us this weekend. And Lisa Thompson, Minister of Government and Consumer Services, and John Yakabuski, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, whose teams are also ready to be called on in upcoming campaigns. Lastly, I want to thank Solicitor General Sylvia Jones for providing her ministry's assistance with the coordination of compliance and enforcement with police services and bylaw enforcement officers. Together, we will help keep the people of Ontario safe as we work to reopen Ontario. And now I'd like to invite Minister Sarkaria to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister McNaughton, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to first take an opportunity to thank uh, Minister Elliott for her leadership. Uh, she has provided a steady hand during one of the most difficult periods of time our province has ever faced. And it has been a particularly difficult time for the residents of Peel and my region. As a lifelong resident of Peel region, I'm very proud of our government's response to this pandemic. And as Premier Ford has said, we will spare no expense to fight against this virus. And that means more funding for testing capacity, more funding for PPE, and supporting 
our small businesses to get through this pandemic. As Ontario's Minister of Small Business, I can say without hesitation that small businesses are a vital part of our communities and vital to our economic recovery. They tell the story of hard work and perseverance. They create jobs that are, employ our families, neighbours and friends. And we want small businesses to be able to keep their doors open. That's why it's so important for people to listen to the public health guidelines and measures on how to keep safe during COVID-19 so these businesses can continue to keep their doors open. Small businesses in Peel Region and in other COVID hot zones have borne a significant share of COVID-19's economic burdens. These businesses need our support now more than ever before. We want them to know that we stand by them. That's why we've created a temporary $300 million rebate program to assist businesses in places like Peel and other hot zones who have been required to close or significantly reduce their operations. Take, for example, a small restaurant that is experiencing a revenue loss of over 80% due to the targeted COVID-19 restrictions. Whether their normal monthly rent is approximately $14,500 through our subsidy programs, they could be eligible for over $13,000 in rent relief. That's almost 90% of the cost of rent for the month. In addition, businesses targeted by health lockdown measures are also eligible for wage subsidies, energy cost relief, and property tax relief as well. In our government's budget, which was tabled last week, we also committed to helping small businesses by making unprecedented investments to expand broadband access across the province. We are lowering electricity rates and reducing business education taxes. These initiatives will provide a significant financial relief for these businesses. Small businesses in Peel and across Ontario make invaluable contributions to our communities and our way of life. And we will never stop fighting for them. Thank you. We'll go to the phone lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. Your first question comes from Tiffany Hensby with News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, good morning. The question is for Minister Elliott. So we have some encouraging news this morning. Some late stage trial data showing that Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is over 90% effective. Suggestions could be available before the end of the year. Uh, with that in mind, um, has the government begun yet conversations around vaccine development? How it might roll out? Who would be the first to get it, et cetera? Yes, first of all, it is absolutely wonderful news uh, that uh, this looks like a vaccine that's going to be very effective, will be available soon. And yes, we do have a, a group within the Ministry of Health that is uh, making arrangements for when a vaccine is available for distribution, uh, determining who the, uh, the first group of people will, who will be receiving the vaccine and so on. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done around that, but it's uh, planning that needs to happen to make sure that we have uh, a fair and equitable response for everyone. Follow up. Okay, and do you have any sense yet of what that fair and equitable response will look like in terms of, you know, are you thinking starting with um, frontline health care? Is it, you know, long-term care homes? Do you have any sense of, of what we can expect to see? Uh, we are working actively on that right now. We don't have anything that uh, has been finalized as yet, but we're, we're discussing it very uh, carefully. Next question. Your next question comes from Colin DeMello with CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, Colin. Uh, hi there. Good morning, Minister. Uh, we're starting to see record-breaking case numbers uh, in Ontario yesterday, 1,300. Uh, I'm just curious, I mean, this, this is higher than what your own modeling projections have said. What is your government going to do to actually bring down the case numbers um, because they seem to be growing out of control? 
Well, that's one of the reasons why we developed the, uh, the framework to uh, determine which public health units would be in what category so that we can start taking actions earlier to uh, prevent cases from growing exponentially, but also to make sure that uh, people will have a, a sense of what's going on in their region. People can make their own personal decisions too, uh, in addition to following the basic contact measures that we've been speaking about throughout the pandemic, but they can make their own decisions about whether they want to go out to uh, go to a restaurant or go to a gym, for example. Uh, the framework is going to be really important for people to know where they stand, that the numbers are being published on a daily basis. And so I think this is really important so that we can try and get ahead of the curve with respect to transmission. And by taking some of those measures earlier, that we can prevent bigger groups of people from getting COVID-19 and can pre prevent um, more significant economic uh, lockdowns in the future. Follow-up? Thank you, but a lot of um, public health officials, frontline doctors, they all say that the framework is actually flawed, that you guys are not going to be ahead of the curve, you're going to be behind the curve, especially with the criteria it takes uh, to enter a red zone. So is your government going to look at, at all amending the criteria? Are you guys going to revisit whether or not uh, the 10% the, the positivity rate threshold? Is there any conversation to bring down those feelings for the, the criteria to enter some of these zones? Well, the framework was developed in consultation with our Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, Dr. Williams, who is here with us this morning. So I'll ask Dr. Williams to please speak to that. <clears throat> yes, well, thank you, Minister. Um, the framework is a framework. That means it has, uh, is not cover all the details. We are asking our tables to look at the different aspects we'd add to that to deal with variations within. And as we sat down, especially with those that were in the modified two zone, uh, it was very clear to them that while the closures had had some effect, it didn't have the full effect they were anticipating and wanted to have stronger measures or issues in related to people's personal behavior their uh, family's behavior, their household behavior in there, that while there were some aspects that would be useful, we need to do more. Therefore, they were most concerned to introduce the concepts of uh, the concept that we use, harm reduction or risk mitigation. And in that range, in the so-called orange zone, there's different things you, could, you need to be doing at one level versus middle versus the upper level. And we really have to work hard at that, much as you've heard the minister and with Minister McNaughton and Mr. Garia saying we have to add more resources into like places like Peel to allow the individuals to go about doing a better job at their personal risk reduction so to reduce that even uh, more than what we were doing under the uh, modified zone too. So there's much to follow, much detailing, much like you do with a framework in a house. There's a lot more to be put on as we do and fill out those areas there to ensure that we have a really good response by the public, which is so critical to bring this down to control because if everyone did what they're supposed to do all the time, we could have Peel back down into a yellow, maybe even a green zone if everybody did everything. It's really important that everybody pulls together and as the minister said, we're doing all we can to enable those citizens of uh, Peel, those families, those households to do all they need to do to bring their community back under control and to ensure that things will stay open and everybody can remain healthy on a go forward basis. Next question. Your next question comes from Jeff Gray with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, it's a question for uh, Mr. Elliott about the new uh, hospital beds. Can you tell us when those beds will actually be online? There's certainly been some discussion about the government's speed and you know, moving at COVID speed, mm -hmm. as the Premier said. When, when, are we, when will those beds actually be uh, up and running? Well, we're working on developing them and putting them in place right now. I can't give you an exact date, but I can tell you that they are necessary. I know that the uh, William Osler Health System has had capacity challenges, so they need those beds right away, and we're working on develop developing them, putting them in place with the necessary staff as quickly as possible. Follow-up? I wonder if you could respond to uh, comments from the head of general surgery at uh, Sunnybrook, but, uh, the CTV uh, web story where uh, 
basically the discussion was about cancer patients concerned that in a few weeks they're going to find their surgery canceled and wanting to get in there and get it done. And he, him saying, well, I have to explain that um, uh, can you know, the province is prioritizing indoor dining and restaurants over cancer surgery. I wonder if you want to respond to that. Well, I can say that this has been an important part of our fall preparedness plan in becoming ready for the second wave of COVID-19. Uh, one is to ensure that we can carry on with those surgeries and procedures that had to be postponed during wave one, uh, because as terrible as it is to lose someone from COVID, it's equally terrible to lose someone you love because of cancer and a surgery that didn't happen when it should have. So we are taking every step that we can to make sure that those surgeries can continue. Uh, cancer surgeries, cardiac, um, other orthopedic surgeries, cataract surgeries. We want to make sure that we can carry on with them. So that's part of the plan for introducing these new beds across the province is to cope with an influx in patients with COVID-19, but also to be able to carry on with those other very important and necessary surgeries. Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Uh, hi, this is also for uh, Minister Christine. Um, Will Toronto still be uh, um, going back to having some indoor dining and gyms open on Saturday, given uh, that, as Colin mentioned earlier, we had more than 1,300 cases, uh, well over your worst case scenario? Well, that will be something that will depend on the numbers that we see coming in this week and uh, discussions with Dr. Davila. Uh, but I would like to ask Dr. Williams to please comment on that as well. <coughs> Yeah, well, thank you, Rob, for the question. And it's a, one that we're looking at to assess as we go forward. Uh, the worst case scenario um, by the uh, table, the modeling table, they said that by the early of November, we would be well over 1,000, 12 to 1,400 cases. So they were pretty accurate on that. If we continue to flatten, we would stay away from going to two to 3,000 a day by the middle of November. So we are hoping to uh, keep to that and stick and keep the numbers down. As far as the aspects related to the restaurants and that, you know that the numbers today, the 1,300, a majority of which are in Toronto, Peel and York, somewhat in, in Ottawa, uh, all are were occurring when they were in modified zone two, when the restaurants were closed. So um, we're going to address, as I mentioned before, and as Dr. Lowe is trying to do, to say you have to do more than beyond uh, just closing gyms and restaurants. It's people's behavior around that. Everybody has to do their responsibility and part in this aspect here, because uh, while having the modified two did work to some extent, it was our anticipation and that of the medical officers in those areas that it could have done even more. Therefore, we're gonna to have to put more in, especially around informing our public about risk mitigation and what you have to do personally, whether you do go to a gym or don't go to a gym, you go to a restaurant, you go to any social gathering, whether it's out in the park or in your backyard or in your house, you still have to do all the measures that the minister outlined that you know very well, everybody understands, it's just that people have a bit of COVID fatigue and I think it's the time to refocus, almost like the students after they've had their break to come back to university, you have to get ready, you have to work down hard to get those assignments done. And now we have to work hard to get our assignment done as individuals and Ontarians to get this back under control so that uh, we are going to uh, keep our schools open, keep our long-term care visitation open, and keep our hospitals working as they should. So this is a challenge for all of us, not just for the ones in the so-called modified two going to orange and appeal to the red at this time. Follow up? So uh, just to follow up, maybe saying with Dr. Williams, but Minister Elliott, feel free to chime in. Where is uh, all this failing? Um, everyone knows that COVID is dangerous. We've seen what's happened in the States. Michigan next door last week had 5,700 cases one day, a, a record for them. We're heading up. People aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Have you lost control of this? No, we have a comprehensive plan to deal with it. And when you look at how Ontario is performing compared to many of those other jurisdictions, we're doing, uh, we're doing well, but there is more work to do, no question about it. We need people to understand that they have a direct role and responsibility here in following the public health measures. That is uh, the, the golden rule. That is what's going to really make the difference. We can take all the other measures that, uh, that we can, but ultimately it comes down 
to the individual to please keep your physical distance, please wear a mask if you can't do that, please stay home if you're not feeling well and wash your hands thoroughly and often. Simple measures, but they make a huge difference. And that's what we're reinforcing across the province. We're especially reinforcing that in Peel region right now to help them get their numbers down. Last question. Your final question comes from Randy Rath with CHCH TV. Please call Hi, ahead. Randy. Hi, Minister. Um, my question is for you, uh, for Mr. Elliott. Um, it's about the, uh, the new vaccine that Pfizer has developed. Um, yes. Considering what has happened with the flu vaccine, isn't distributing a new vaccine going to be a Herculean effort in that it has to be kept really cold? People have to get uh, two shots. And um, do you have a time frame, say if we got this in January, when it would be distributed? Well, distributing the vaccine is going to have many challenges, of course, in terms of the refrigeration or freezing, whatever needs to be done. That's why we really need to have a very detailed plan for when we receive the uh, the doses of the of the vaccine. And as soon as we receive them, need, we need to be prepared to distribute them so that people can get the, the vaccines as quickly as possible. That's why we have an entire unit at the Ministry of Health that's working on that right now. And they will have a detailed plan available by the time the vaccine is ready. Follow up and this is the last question. And, and Minister, could you explain what a 90% effectiveness means? Uh, does that mean there's still going to be 10% of the cases that we have now? Um, is, is, is COVID still going to be out in our community? And um, are we going to be in a position where we still have to be masked mm -hmm. when we're out in public? even if there is a vaccine. This is a, a question that I would like to refer to Dr. Williams as a public health expert. <clears throat> so vaccine effectiveness, vaccine efficacy, these are fancy terms. Uh, what we want to know is from the manufacturers and in their clinical trials, if they say they give it to, for example, 100 people, uh, because everybody's immune system is slightly different, their ability to respond is slightly different, and you're given to different age groups, some which systems are more robust than others. So as a result, they have, say they have demonstrated that 90 out of the 100 will uh, give a proper immune response in there. Now, of course, on a population-wide level, we may have to see how that works out. Uh, in that, and of course, you know that we have one vaccine, but there are others that the federal government has put uh, bids into, and there may be other products coming in after this one as well. And so, there's a variety there. So, one is the fact is if you get up to 90 percent uh, coverage, which is people right now, we saw the um, serial surveillance before, we do not have because of our ability to keep the numbers down, we have a low level of uh, uh, protection already in the community, but if you get a number of individuals, 90% of whom that risk group has protection, that would be reassuring. We don't know what the number is to give a so-called herd immunity. Uh, in there, is it the same as measles, where you have to be up in the upper 90%? We're thinking it's a bit lower than that. And so that 90%, if we gave it to people and had that coverage, I do feel we could limit it and bring it down, because the test is really, will the numbers drop right off and go down to minimal and hardly seeing them at all? And so that's where the real test is, as compared to the clinical trials, the actual application in the field. But so far, it's all looking promising. But as the minister said, there's a lot of work to be done to get ready for it to bring it in, to send it out, to deliver it, and to make sure it gets into the right people at the right time as best as possible and as much coverage as you can get in a proper way of undertaking a vaccine program, which in Ontario with our universal influenza immunization program, the biggest in the country, we have a lot of experience on the ground already and we're continuing to drive and work at that as well. Thanks everyone.